This is Support a Sexy, episode number 22, with Salt Group CEO, Teju Owoye. Welcome to the Support is Sexy podcast. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, producer, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I talk to women entrepreneurs who share their journeys and the true stories of their wins and their lessons and give you insight and inspiration to take your business and your life to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I am so happy to have you here because it just would not be the same without you. So today, our guest, I am truly excited. I was so thrilled to talk to her because honestly, a lot of the things that she talks about of what she was going through in her business, I'm going through in my business now. So it was sort of like an interview, getting all the answers to the questions that I had in general for my own business, being a little selfish. But that's how it felt, and it was amazing. Her name is Teju Owoye, and she is the CEO of Salt Group, which is a marketing firm that works with small businesses and larger companies and really helps them get their marketing strategy together. Teju talks about her journey from starting as a fashion business, actually, and how she decided to pivot or decided that she needed to pivot along the way down the road when she saw that the first business wasn't making money. She wanted to do something that made money and was a contribution, which all of us try to balance in our business. So some of the great things that Teju talks about today is asking yourself some key questions to help you figure out what you're supposed to be doing in your business and in your life and the ways you want to contribute. Also, figuring out what you want to contribute to this world Writing down what an ideal day is for you. I am in a mastermind group and the leader of the group, Rachel, often tells us to write down what an ideal day looks like for you from morning to evening. And it's a really excellent practice. And Teju talks about why this was good for her and is good for people to do. Also, what's the next best step that you can take? Something to consider. Getting your MVP ASAP. You'll understand that when you listen more to the episode. And also learning the art of surrender in business, which is an idea and a concept that I absolutely love. So this episode is chock full of advice, pen and paper, phone, whatever you need to capture it all, or you can listen to it more than once. That'll be lovely too. I know you're going to enjoy it though. So without further ado, Teju Owoye. So Teju, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. Yay. Thank you so much, Elaine. It's an honor to be be on your show. Super excited as well. Great. So I have to ask you the first question I ask everyone. When did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Oh, man, that's a a great question. You know, I think that I've always been an entrepreneur in some fashion, even from, you know, the age of five, I was trying to sell stuff. You know, it was the girl that had a lemonade stand. And, um, you know, when those those uh, bracelets were in when you could make beaded bracelets and, you know, do the, the floss bracelets. I was the one that was making them at school and trying to sell them to my friends. It was always trying to sell something from a small age. Uh, but it wasn't until probably my mid 20s that I really, you know, I was in the corporate world, um, really got the insight and the know how and how a business works in a big corporation. And then um, I transitioned to work for a startup. And I think that working at the startup really reignited that entrepreneurial spirit. To see that you can grow something from the ground um, all the way up to a big company is what just enlivened me. So, uh, you know, from there started to pursue my entrepreneurial j- journey. But it was so, it sounds like it was something that was always a part of you or in you. Definitely. My mom's an entrepreneur. Um, you know, my dad comes from a family of entrepreneurs. And I was always trying to sell something. And my <laughs> sister, brother and I, I would make them do, I'm the oldest, and I would make them do plays. And we would charge our, I would charge my parents to come see the play. <laughs> I love own house. <laughs> I love so that. In, in one way or the other. <laughs> oh, I love that. Now you grew up in Danbury, Connecticut, right? I did. Yes. Yep. So what were you like as a child? What was a young Teju like? You know, I was definitely a book nerd. I have to say I, I love reading. I'm still a book nerd now. Uh, now I actually listen to audible uh, audiobooks as I walk and work out. But, uh, you know, definitely a book nerd, loved reading, was a big fan of like Nancy Drew, uh, the Boxcar Children. I know I'm like dating myself now. <laughs> those were the books like I just I just I couldn't get enough of reading. There was a program at our local library that I'm so glad my mom 
put my sister, my brother and I, and I was called book it. And you would go to the library for the summer and pick out your favorite books and then get prizes as you read more and more. And I would like be done with the whole summer program in a week and a half. I was just like a voracious reader. Um, I was also into sports. So I'm still, you know, super athletic and into sports. I played soccer, basketball, lacrosse um, all throughout my, my youth into high school and then a bit in college. I played a bit of lacrosse at UConn. Um, so, so yeah, active and always reading. <laughs> I love it. So tell us what's your two things, what's your favorite sport and what's your favorite book? Oh, wow. Ooh, good, good question. Um, <laughs> favorite sport for me to play lacrosse, I definitely love the elegance. Uh, I don't, I don't think I'm the best at lacrosse. So I was probably better at basketball, but I just love the elegance of lacrosse. Um, such a beautiful, fun sport, um, to watch. I definitely love basketball. I'm a, I'm a big basketball fan. Mm-hmm. Favorite book, uh, you know, it, it, there's probably it's hard to narrow them down. I think yeah. it's changed as I've gotten older and as I've grown up and gone through my career. Um, if I were ha- if I were to pick one, hmm, I think. And I know would, you have a whole book list on I, one of your sites, so I know that's why it's a hard <laughs> question for you. I know, but get, just move on. I favorite know, or to- most maybe uh, favorite or most recommended that you recommend to people. You know, I would have to say Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. Mm-hmm. I think that that's just such a solid place to start. Um, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, if you are someone that's, you know, going on a uh, growth journey of any sort, I think that that's such a really powerful book and it relates to so many people and it's timeless. I mean, the book was written, I think it was in the 30s mm-hmm. and it's just, it transcended generations. Uh, so that's definitely, I probably could say that's my favorite and one I recommend and I give out as gifts and I give to everyone. I love that. One of my favorites to give out is um, Stephen Pressfield's um, The Art. Yes. Yes, yes. The War of Art. The War of Art. And then um, what's his other book about? uh, It's like about getting stuff done or. Like uh, Do the Work or uh, or something like that. Yeah, we have to. We'll make sure we put. I'll make sure I put links so people can find all of these. I find myself, I read that like once a year. um, And I find myself on my phone or my Kindle. I'll take screenshots of just like. that he drops. I do that too. I thought I was the only person. I do that too. I do that from videos. I do that from everything. I do that all the time. I think there's one like he's like the amateur tweets, the pro works. That was <laughs> Yes, that's one of the names of his books, Turning Pro, I think it's called. That's the one, exactly. Turning Pro. Yep, yep, that's exact one. <laughs> Excellent. So who are some of your greatest um influences growing up? Oh, so, you know, so many people at different stages. And, you know, I I felt and I feel I continue to feel blessed that I have had such a supportive tribe of people um, who believed in me. You know, there's definitely has been those naysayers. But for the most part, um, I've been so lucky to attract people in my life who said, hey, you can do it and to push me to that next level. Uh, Definitely my parents, my mom, my dad, uh, you know, both came uh, my dad's from Nigeria. My mom is from down south. And they, you know, they both overcame so much to get to where they are and to provide us with a really amazing, amazing, uh, you know, lifestyle and childhood. Um, you know, as well, just have always my my both grandmothers, um, you know, they're just such hard workers. Uh, and, you know, they really taught me growing up the value of hard work, the value of family, um, the value in, uh, you know, culturally understanding where you come from. Uh, so I say that definitely parents, family, um, and I've had great, uh, great mentors, like way too many to mention, but mm-hmm. people who have pushed me when I thought I couldn't go on any further, you know, whether it be sports, school, whatever it may be, there's always been someone to swoop in and be like, listen, I know you've got this. And I, 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 I think that that's one of the most powerful things to have is to have people that believe and have got your back and remind you of that, um, you know, on a daily basis. Now, when you first went into um, your career, you started off in the space of wellness. I know you said you were an athlete and did a lot with wellness. Now, you didn't think about entrepreneurship from that point, it sounds like, but it seems like. But um, what was it that drew you to the wellness space? You know, I, um, I've i always been active and into health and, you know, more so how do you prevent uh, preventable diseases? You know, how do you take care of yourself? How do you live a life um, of abundance and wellness. And I think that well, true wealth is not only having the time to do what you want to do, but then also having your health intact, having the relationships that make you feel vibrant and alive. 
Um, so I was working for health insurance. Uh, I was working for a company. I was working for Aetna. And uh, they were just, this was, you know, back when consumerism and the age of, you know, really driving people to shop for their health insurance and understand claims costs was just becoming um, into fruition. And there was a wellness program that had just launched at Aetna. We were piloting it. And I was like, wow, this is super cool. Um, you know, people at like, are, we get to award points for doing healthy behaviors. This is stuff I already do. And I was, I became the, you know, quote unquote evangelist for it in my office and helped to launch it in my field office. Um, and then I was a big advocate of American Heart Association's Heart Walk program um, and launched a Heart Walk in Charlotte, North Carolina. And that was like really what started it. Um, you know, it was great to just see people in my office bond over going for a walk during lunch and feeling better and more productive by just getting out. And, um, you know, it really helped me too. I think uh, one of the greatest things was that was like my first time of leading something outside of my work responsibilities and that entrepreneurial spirit was able to come out, um, you know, through those wellness initiatives. I think that's so important. Um, a lot of us often talk about the entrepreneurial side, which is obviously important. That's who we are, women entrepreneurs. But I always encourage people, too, to look at the, exactly what you did. How can you be an entrepreneur, as they call it, and figure out a way to lead within the company that you're already in, if that's a possibility? Absolutely. And I think that that's a, the best way to learn it, I say, is on someone else's dime. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, okay, how can I learn how to lead a project, get a team together? Because that's what entrepreneurship is also about it's not just about the great idea the great idea I mean the ideas are a dime a dozen it's really about getting the right people to help you execute and I think that any way that you can do that before leaving a, a paycheck is really really critical because uh, you know once you've got those those skills into place then you can move faster you can execute faster um, and then build that rallying troop that's going to help you succeed because you cannot do it alone it's just it's it's not feasible that's right. Now, at what point did you decide while you were within that company or whichever company it was that you you were going to make the step to be an entrepreneur? I had always I had always known. And I think that um, somewhere that year, so it was in my early 20s, this was my first job at a school. I just started to like feel a little unsettled and I can't describe it. You it's know, always that it's feeling like weird. I'm not really supposed to be here. I don't think I'm supposed to live in this city. Something's awry. You know, I know making great money for a 22 year old. This is super awesome. I'm getting these huge insurance bonuses, like, you know, win win. I was traveling a ton. Um, what so city were you in at that time? I was living in Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay, right. Yep. So I was down in Charlotte, and, it, you know, it was like, you know, this is, this is well and good. Um, it afforded me a ton of opportunities to travel. And I think through like my experiences traveling and, you know, I started to meet other people who were, you know, kind of living lifestyle design. So they were traveling, they had a business and my interest was really peaked. I was like, wait, how are these people doing this? You know, they're off in Spain for half the year and they're working on their business. Like there's something when I'm going back to my keyboard, <laughs> like something's not adding up. Like, what, you know, what am I doing wrong? And then I just started to read books and I, you know, I uh, went to Barnes & Noble, you know, legit one Saturday, what, what, like, strolled to the local Barnes & Noble. like, I've got to find a book. There's something out there that's going to help me decipher what I need to do. And I stumbled on Tim Ferriss's four-hour oh, work week in the Charlotte Barnes & Noble. And that was the game changer for me. And then I read Va Vagabonding. I read a book about taking a sabbatical. Um, I didn't know exactly how I was going to formulate my next steps, but I knew that I needed to free up my time. So I need to get a job where I could work from home, um, and then I need to start tinkering. Uh, so it led me to leave my job at Aetna. I, I worked for another company where I had a little bit more flexibility, and that's when I started to tinker. I didn't know what business it was going to be, but on, on my spare time, I was testing things, iterating, and trying to figure it out. You said so many great things in there. I can hardly keep up. That was fantastic. <laughs> First, this idea of just, uh, which seems to come up with several of the women entrepreneurs I talked to, of being open and knowing that, okay, this isn't it. I'm not exactly sure what is it. And start asking questions. Because sometimes I know we feel like, I even go through this too. We have to know the answers or we're not going to make a move. And for you, it was go to the Barnes and Noble, pick up a book. The four hour work week is the book too that made me realize, okay, right. I'm not crazy. This is right. possible. I don't right. know how it's going to work for me, but there are people who do this thing and I didn't know yeah and then you start as you said you made a transition like a, or thinking about okay what's the first step I need a position that allows me to have more flexibility and then start tinkering I love that word tinkering is so critical because it takes a pressure off of I've got to get this right because you won't get it right I didn't get it right for years it took me many tries many starts stops failures 
an attempt to go to grad school and realizing I wasn't supposed to be in grad school. I mean, there was a whole bunch of different things throughout this process that led me from what looks like on paper, point A to point B. But I can tell you um, in that process, I was at point D at one point, I went to Z, then I like strolled back to F. I mean, it was uh, like all over the place to finally get to uh, point B. But I think that um, one of the most powerful questions, and I think I read this in some article, like as I was on that discovery journey, um, is what do I feel like I should be contributing to the world? And I continue to ask myself that throughout the year. I ask myself that now, um, you know, is what I'm doing my ultimate purpose? And if not, continuing to ask yourself those deep questions, you know, who am I? Why was I put here? What's meaningful to me? What is the ideal day? I think that that was another powerful one. Um, you know, I can't remember where I read this as well, but someone said, you know, map out really from the second that you wake up, to, you know, when you rest your head on that pillow at night, what is your ideal day? Um, and in that first year, when I was, you know, kind of plotting to leave Aetna, I, I really, I came up with this vision. I was like, it'd be awesome if I woke up um, in California, I lived by the beach, I was running my business, I was involved in these charity things, you know, so on and so forth. And then to start to ask, okay, how can I do this? And who's already doing this? So I can ask them how they got there. Right. And that was to the model the behavior. Yep. Yep, absolutely. And that was one of the most important things because I had no I had no clue. Mm -hmm. My parents were like, Hey, you just got I had just gotten into Northwestern uh, for grad school and my, my dad's a professor, so of course they were like, Oh, that's awesome, you're gonna go to grad school and uh, you know, I planned on doing that and then all of a sudden as I was going on this journey I I took a class at Northwestern and was like, mm, this is not really for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so throughout that process, they were like, oh, have you lost your mind? Right. What are what you are doing? doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Right. Grad school to move across the country to California and like kind of start a business? This like this can be. So uh, it was really helpful then to just like reflect within. And it's, this, it's one of the hardest things um, I've ever had to do. Uh, reflect within and say, you know, I don't need to have everything figured out right mm -hmm. right now. I just need to figure out the next best thing. And, you know, taking those baby steps in order to get to, uh, you know, the iterations of your ultimate goal. Right. I, I think that's something that Oprah actually talks about, too. What's the next best step right. that you can take? Sometimes looking so far down the road, like you said, you have a vision of how you want your day to look like and what you want to do each day. But what's the next best step? Right. Because that's the only way that you're going to get there. You know, you, you can only get from point A to point B on a map by, you know, going through the forest, getting on the highway, doing what you need to do and, right. and driving on that road, um, you know, and just accepting the turn by turn uh, because it's any journey has a turn by turn and you have to be at peace and enjoy that. That's a, that's a cool part about the process. Uh, you know, I learned so much about myself, about standing up to people, about, owning my worth, my value about really, uh, you know, going against the norm, um, and becoming a stronger person that, yeah, it was super painful at the time, but I don't think I would have learned those things had I not gone on this journey. So how did you know when you did finally tinker to the point where you got to that thing, as far as your business, like this is the thing I'm going to, or your first business, this is the thing I'm going to try to set out and do. So it was funny. My first, my first, first business that I, the, the business I left my last job for someone else at was a, a company called Tesoto. Um, and it's an e-commerce website. It's still up and running. Um, but it's, you know, kind of been scaled to the point where it's just passive. So long story short, I was at that job and I was like, I was ready to go. I was like, you know, <laughs> I'm ready to work on my business. I've been working on this Tesoto thing. And, um, you know, funny story, I was supposed to go to Peru for two weeks. And uh, I had booked my flight and was ready to go. But something in me was like, you know, you can't go for two weeks. You need to stay. And at this time, I was living in San Diego. You need to stay and work on this business. So I canceled my trip at the last minute and stayed and worked on my business. And I think that that was it for me. Mm. It's one of my passions. And for me to cancel a trip to Peru to work on, to work. like An I was already like, booked trip. I, exactly. Already paid for, ready to go. Uh, I was like, you know, the fact that I'm so excited to work on this, that's, this is it. And this is what I got to do. Ultimately, that business didn't make me much money at all. But it was the catalyst to me learning and figuring out what are the key indicators to getting and, you know, knowing that you're close to having a successful business. What MVP, minimal viable product do you need to have out there? How many sales do you need? I learned about like looking at your cash flow statements, hiring people, 
I mean, just a ton from that business that now the company I have now, very quickly, I was able to say, okay, this is it. I've got it. Like, here's, you know, how I can launch this lean. And here's how it, and when I know that, uh, you know, I'm onto something. Nice. Now with your other, with uh, Tesudo, that's how you pronounce it? Yep, Tesudo, yep. What, were the, what would you say was other than not making any uh, money from it, which is obviously a challenge, oh, but yeah. what would you say were some of the, the challenges of that type of business, or at least in your experience? Oh, man, I think I was just naive about business in general. Like, I, I you know, I went through a startup incubator um, called the Founder Institute, which was great. And I, that was where I just started to really learn entrepreneurship. Um, I have to say entrepreneurship is it's an art and it, it is it's an art. It's a game. Um, and it is also uh, you've got to have that fuel, that fire and that passion. And um, I think I, I needed to learn the art of entrepreneurship, the art and science of it. Um, you know, so, so one of the hardest things for me, was just naivete. I didn't know it was like, oh, I'm going to run this like fashion company, you know, nasty gal was blowing up and I'm like, you know, I'm going to sell these awesome products, bada boom, bada bing. I'll be on <laughs> like, not so much. <laughs> I love it. We all go through it, whether people admit it or not, we all go I'm, through it. Like, you're like, okay, well, like, what am I going to wear in the cover of four? Right. You know? <laughs> you're already and, you're already Meanwhile, down the road. Exactly. You like haven't made a dollar. That was totally <laughs> like that. That was me, to be honest. Uh, so I think the hardest thing was just, yeah, knowing and figuring out what I didn't know. I, I don't think I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And right. I had to very quickly learn. Um, so there was a lot of like bumps and scrapes and bruises. Also, my background had been in SaaS and software as a service companies and technology and wellness. I had never worked for a fashion company, really. I had never run an e-commerce site. So I had zero clue on how to do that. How do you source products? Um, I try to manufacture products. So it was how do I manufacture a product? Like, you know, how do you get the fabric? Like, how do you cut a product? I mean, there's just like a ton. How do you get the right sewers? There's a ton of learning curve stuff mm -hmm. that I jumped right into the deep end. I had already quit my job at this point. And I mean, literally talk about like jumping from the cliff with no parachute and like trying to use a straw and a watermelon to make a, a, a parachute. That's why I fell <laughs> and running that business. I'm like, wait a second, this is a hot mess. And <laughs> I'm like getting close to the ground and I, I got to make this watermelon into a parachute. Right. Like, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> a straw and a watermelon. That's a tough parachute. I love that. So close to the ground, obviously, is when you were like, I got to reinvent. I have to do something. Oh, I, oh, definitely. I definitely hit the ground and like did one of those bouncy ball things where I was like bouncing. <laughs> um, I'm definitely the type of person where I throw myself all in. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, we're in it to win it. We're going to jump all in. And I did with this business. Definitely hit the ground, went broke. Like, I'm so honest, like anyone that knows my story and I, I'm super candid about it. I went broke. I had to like give up my fancy apartment in San Diego. Mm -hmm you know, move back in with my family to like, you know, you move back to Connecticut, move back to Connecticut for yeah. a bit um, to like figure it out. I was like, Oh it's my goodness. Reset. Yeah. I need a, I need a reset. Serious. Like this is, you know, yeah. this is like not going as planned. I'm not on Forbes yet. What right. <laughs> and I have my outfit picked out already. What is happening? Instead I'm in my parents' house. Hmm. What is happening? So I mean, I definitely let it, I pushed it. Um, and, uh, you know, in that I learned resilience. I wouldn't recommend for everyone to do that. You know, I'm so fortunate that I do have a support system. And my family was like, hey, listen, we see how hard you've been working and hustling. Come back, figure it out, and then move forward. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just so scary. I'd never been broke before. I mean, I'd never been broke before. I'd always worked these, you know, high at paying jobs and, and tech and SaaS. And it's so humbling. You learn who your friends really are. Mm -hmm. You learn what really matters in life, the material stuff that I had so, I was holding on to, I've got to live in a high rise apartment with a doorman. I mean, just like these superficial things that I thought were so important were important. And I realized my passion for entrepreneurship. I was like, you know, I'd rather be broke as an entrepreneur and hustle and figure it out than go sit in a cubicle job. Um, so that whole year I spent scrapping, doing different things. Like, you know, I was working as a promo model. I was like booking modeling gigs still. I was like just doing things on the side. I was trying different business ideas in order to keep myself moving. Right. In the evenings I was iterating, okay, what else can I launch? You know, what are some other needs? Uh, what are some other pain points that I can solve? And my business started to be less about ego. I feel like, feel like Tosoto is more about ego. Like, here's what I feel. I should have this fashion company. And I, I shifted to being more about how can I solve a need in the marketplace? How can I help people? Mm -hmm. 
how could I do and create a business that adds value? Um, and, and that became my barometer for anything that I even thought about launching, which is what you really should be thinking about when you uh, start a business. That's so powerful what you said about ego too, because some, sometimes it's either youth or just this need to, to create something that really feels good to us. I mean, that's part of, you know, the ego is I in Latin. So it's right. just about, oh, what do I want? What do I want to contribute? And it could be from a, a good place of what it, you're still thinking what you want to contribute, but not as much how will it serve other people. Because I feel like with my my business, um, Chic Rebellion, I love the idea and the concept and creating this network and really creating a space for content for women of color. But then I, I thought about it recently in the same way. Like, was I looking at how it could really serve people? Or was I looking at how great it looks, what I'd be offering, what I would be contributing? And now I'm looking at how do I rework this so it is really a space of service for people? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that there's like a, there's like a fine line because each of us has such unique gifts Mm -hmm. that it is. And we are, I really do feel like we're divinely like put here to add those unique gifts to the world and to like add a a unique flair to any type of business or any type of way that will attack and solve a problem. You know, because between you and I, we won't look at solving a company's issues at the same way. We're going to do it in different ways. But I think that, you know, really where true entrepreneurship comes in is, leaving the part where, uh, you know, like, this is what I should do, because this is who I believe I am. And really flipping that question to saying, you know, how can I solve problems, and then add my unique flair to solving that problem, Mm. Um, you know, where I'm still focused on the problem at hand for other people. But you know, maybe my emails are worded a little bit differently. Maybe the way that I launch my website is different. And maybe the approach to customer service is a little bit different. But at the end of the day, it comes back to making sure you're solving someone else's problem, not just a problem that you perceptively think other people have. Um, you know, which is a huge, huge difference. How do we go about finding out what other people's problems are? Yeah. Oh, that's, I think that that's, that is the the secret sauce. Is it, is it on a shelf somewhere where we can go find out and just pour it out and look at it? I think that'll be my next business. Right. Uh, (laughs) You know, I think a couple things that I've learned, I think number one is just, you know, again, like getting humble enough to realize that what you think is someone else's problem may not be their problem. And I was talking about this with someone the other day, you know, we have this, um, university program that we're working on for salt we started out making these marketing classes and i was talking to a couple entrepreneurs and they're like you know i don't really know if i want classes like there's so many things i'm trying to do and learn uh, i just want someone to like do it for me and i was like what mm. we're like you know we're like jamming on creating these these online classes and you just want someone to do the work for you that's not you know what i thought but i'm like wait a second that's that's their unique problem and you know the more and more i spoke with people um you know like hey i don't want to classes are great, but I, I need, I just need help. Um, you know, very different than the hypothesis that we set out with. And I think that it's just getting clear on who your target audience is and then actually asking them, like people right. still, they're totally willing to tell you what's wrong. I think one of the most powerful questions that you can ask when you're discovering and trying to figure out how to craft your business is to ask someone else, what are you struggling with? Um, you know, what are you struggling with with marketing? What are you struggling with, with getting your pet taken care of, whatever it may be. Um, and having them authentically express that, uh, and, and then using that as the leverage and the, the point to start crafting your business and iterating, knowing that it's never going to be set in stone. Uh, keep asking and keep developing it as you go. One of the things I've heard people say with asking, like you said, what are you struggling with? It's what are you struggling with and what else and what else? <laughs> And what kind of keep pushing that person to really get to because usually people start with, oh, you know, I just am overwhelmed and too busy. And what else? It's like, well, I really have to do a lot with social media, for example, and and what else? And it takes me a lot of time to, you know, so you really kind of keep sort of digging and unearthing what their their problem is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And once you kind of get a sense, you know, say someone's like, hey, I'm struggling with social media. What else? Well, I don't really understand how these platforms work. And you're, you're like, okay, what else? It'd be awesome if someone just did it for me. So you're like, okay, let me do this like schedule automation thing, like a you know, hub, right. I mean, sweet player. I don't know what it, what it may be. Mm-hmm. But I think the most important thing is getting to that minimal viable product ASAP and showing it to someone, even if it's just like a landing page where it pitches to the person, here's how I'm going to solve your problem. 
and seeing if they have a, a reaction to that. If they're like, whoa, whole, oh snap, like I need this. Like, where can I sign up for this? Right. Then you're on to something and continuing to do that until you get that type of response. That's so good too, because it's it's this idea of being in action and not sort of wait. You, like you said, ask the questions, but you don't want to spend three years asking questions. Like, Definitely. Which oh, sometimes man. we get fro- frozen right. in that stage. And like you said, put something out there and don't spend the hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it. Figure out a lean way to do it and say, what about this? Or, you know, an image, whatever it is to give people a sense of what you're thinking. Absolutely. I couldn't. I mean, it's so critical. And I, I think that that was one of the things I wish I had learned when I was first starting entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur and looking into entrepreneurship. Um, no, you don't need to spend $100,000. Literally, I try to launch a business with a hundred dollars. I'm like, okay, what can I do? And it, it keeps my, me like mentally sharp. It's like, I have a hundred dollars to spend on this idea. What can I do to get like a landing page up to like cold call a couple people, pitch the idea, um, and you know, see if it's going to sell. And if it's not working, then I need to pivot it. And, and, you know, time is so precious and especially mm-hmm. in the competitive market, you don't have time to spend three years, you know, maybe unless you're like working on some big biotech thing. But you really don't have t- the time to spend on, uh, you know, just spinning your wheels. Get it out there. Even if it looks kind of half-baked. Right. It doesn't there. have to look perfect. That's the other thing I was going to say. Don't wait. First of all, it'll never be perfect. Even when you think it's perfect, you'll still go back and tweak. I was up at 2 o'clock in the morning tweaking something on my website just because it's constant. Exactly. It's constant. And that's the movement. That's the momentum. And you, the best way to grow is grow with your customers. Mm. Hey, what should I improve next? You know, and I think that that is one of the things I learned in working uh, in at a SaaS company. So all the developers are always doing agile sprints. They would do right. scrum about, you know, hey, here's what we're working on. Do the same thing as an entrepreneur. Okay, let me ask a customer what feature, not what feature do you want to see next? Because at the end of the day, right. You're not the one that's going to be patting your pockets or paying for your service. Ask your customers, what do you want to see next? What's going to help you the most? Do that and then see how that fares and continue to move forward from there. I love that. So tell us about your pivot from Tesudo to doing what you do now with with your great agency, Salt Group. Yes, absolutely. So, oh man, it was, you know, such a journey. I got to the point with Tesudo. I was like, you know, I don't think I'm really solving anyone's problems here. You know, I, I met with a great mentor um, who is an alum at the University of Connecticut, sat down with him, and he's like, mm, you know, you're not really solving anyone else's problems. And I think that that was the bitter pill that I needed to hear. So I was like, okay, I'm going to keep this where it is, and I'm going to iterate. I'm going to not feel bad about it. Um, I'm going to try a couple other things. And I, I, I was testing, I was testing, and I got hired as a consultant for an agency to work on a couple big accounts um, and to do some work for companies like Starbucks and Lipton and Aquafina. I never worked in an agency, I have no agency, um, had no agency experience at that time. And, you know, I got to come in and talk about the things that I'm good at, uh, you know, consumer behavior and behavioral economics and, you know, how to motivate people to take action. So all these things that I had done in my career up until that point that seemed nebulous and un- um, unrelated the dots started to connect and I was having a ton of fun doing it. Um, One of the things I noticed when I was at this agency though, was there's a lot of great ideas, but you know, how do we tie that back to ROI and how do we use data analytics and metrics uh, to tie marketing back to ROI and action, so on and so forth. It wasn't as tight as I thought it could be. And that's how Salt Group started. It was how do we take marketing and then use some of the things I had learned in tech to create what's called a growth marketing strategy. So something that, uh, you know, is really actionable, but then also we're able to give clients a lot of real time hard data to show how campaigns are really working, uh, to show how they're getting c- connected to their first degree of, of customers. Uh, and the difference with this business was I just built a quick, like, I built a quick site. I think I built my site in a night, to be honest. I was mm-hmm. like, okay, I have this idea. I'm just going to like spend a little bit of time on it. And the next day, I just started cold emailing random people like, hey, here's this idea I have. Like, are you interested? In were these that- people within your own, uh, sorry to interrupt you, were these people within your own network? or that you- no, Like random folks. I looked on, you know, uh, Craigslist. I looked on Indeed.com. I, you know, it's like, who's hiring? Is anyone even hiring for this? Or is anyone even looking for an agency or someone that has these skills? And mm-hmm. I just literally reached out to people and said, hey, 
I got this thing going, you know, how would you feel if we solved, you know, one, two, three problems and started to get a response back right away. Really? And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the sign. Isn't that something? And it was like you said, your, your site might not have been perfect at that time or that page. It was even the concept of what you wanted to do. It was still feeling it out. Exactly. And it was not, and it still is not. Um, but you know, it was like, unlike my other business where it had taken me two years to actually realize like, Hey, what I'm doing is not really working mm-hmm. for this business. I want to know in two days, like I want to you know, <laughs> know immediately if I'm hearing crickets, then I need to, you know, kind of pause and think through things again. Right. And so what were some of the responses that you that you got? Was it people actually saying, Oh, yes, I would pay for this or just even showing some other kind of interest that let you know, you should move forward? Absolutely. It was, it was everything in between small business owners saying, you know, hey, I'd love to set up a meeting with you and talk more about what you're offering. This is really cool. Yes, we've been struggling with our marketing for a long time. Awesome. Tell me more about these reports that you guys have. So on and so I mean, there's just like a ton of engagement. Um, and right away, people who are like trying to pay me for the service when, when the site was like, you know, not really that savvy or sophisticated or anything like that. They're like, oh, my God, if I can get you to help me optimize my Facebook ads if you could give me a growth strategy for this campaign, I would absolutely like, do you have time now? I mm-hmm. want to talk about it. Um, so, so that was, and it was from random people. I mean, these were literally people on Craig's, like people who are hiring marketing managers on Craigslist or indeed that I just randomly reached out to. And the fact that they responded, that was huge for me. The fact that they responded too also shows that it truly was a pain point because these are, well, it's not a warm connection. Like you said, you're cold calling or cold emailing. So they're definitely responding because they have a need or an interest. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that was something that for my other business, I had not seen or anything else I had started. Um, it was, you know, felt very much like me pushing, pushing, pushing. And I, one of the things I realized in business is just the art of surrender. So if something, if you mm-hmm. feel like you're pushing too, too hard um, and, and, and not in a, and I think that there's pushing because you feel like you can do more. And then there is this like, pushing that feels yucky, that feels like, you know, I I just like nothing's really manifesting. I'm not getting value. Like you're forcing it. Yeah, I'm really forcing it. Exactly. Exactly. It's like the watermelon and straw situation. (laughs) This is like very parallel. My favorite favorite analogy. (laughs) Um, You know, if you feel like that, something's not right, because you know, it should feel like effort, but it shouldn't feel like a struggle all the time. Um, And I think that that's really important to know and to do those gut checks. Right. And now for your email, um, were you, did you make it sort of very short and succinct? Like, this is what it is. This is what I'm offering. Not trying to explain the whole journey that got you to that point. Because sometimes we over, I think especially as women, we over g- give uh, too much information as opposed to this is what I'm solving. Are you interested? Absolutely. And I think that this is one of the things I did learn in trying to, I was trying to pitch products on to Soto.com to get into um, some bigger resellers. Uh, like e-bags and net a so on and so forth. And one of the things I learned, I had started off with an email campaign that was like, hi, I'm Teju and here's all the things I'm doing, blah, 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 blah. And then I finally was like, no one's responding what's going on. Right. Uh, and I started to read up on cold emailing. There's some amazing resources like Breakthrough Email, email uh, Tactics. Udemy has some great courses on how to send an effective cold email. And uh, HubSpot as well has some great emails. And I was noticing a trend, like all of the people who had a really effective emails, their emails were like three sentences long. Right. It was like, hi, I'm so-and-so. I found you because, you know, maybe I follow your blog or a friend referred me or I saw your ad on Craigslist, blah, 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 like some type of introduction. Who you're looking for, like, are you the person for me? It was like, are you the person that manages digital marketing or, or growth strategy or so on and so forth? Then one sentence about the problem that you're going to solve. So I have a sh- I have a method to help companies, you know, grow their email list by 400% in X Y Z way, and you can keep it very high level. You don't, you know, you don't have to explain the full on process. Right. Then inviting someone to uh, the meeting. So it was, you know, would love to chat, keeping it informal. Um, you know, what does your calendar look like on Wednesday to connect? And that was my email. That was it. And I still use that email when I'm cold emailing, uh, you know, high end, high end prospects. And it works amazingly. It really does. I love it. That's a great template. Maybe I'll create something, have you look at it and see if we can share it with people as a, as an example of what they can use to do that. that. 
Awesome. For sure. For I'll sure. do that and I'll show it to you, not have you do the work. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. How is your, uh, who is your um, ideal client, would you say? Is it small businesses primarily or? So it is actually mid businesses. We, uh, mid sized businesses who've reach a growth trajectory where they've tried a couple of different digital marketing strategies and they feel like they're at a plateau. So you look at their revenue, maybe they're a bit at a plateau and you look at the return on their, you know, ad spend, campaign spend, they're at a bit of a plateau. What we come in, I have a team of growth strategists that come in and what they're looking at are what are those key indicators? Um, What are the traction channels that you've tried? What has worked, what hasn't worked? How can we make small tweaks? Because it's the smallest tweaks that sometimes net the biggest results. How can we make small tweaks, use some growth hacking best practices in order to like open up the well and help you to acquire more customers? Um, or what are some tertiary markets that you haven't even looked at that we can really help you tap into? Uh, so mid-sized businesses. And then also we have bigger companies we have um, that coming to us saying, hey, we're launching a new product. We want to, you know, really hack the market and get millennial women who are living in these cities give us a strategy and we get hired to develop that strategy come up with the traction channels come up with the consistent messaging um a ton of app launches come to us too for the same type of thing so is it you work on project uh, more so a project basis as opposed to an ongoing like being the marketing team for a company you do more so these are the projects and things that they're doing we're more of, think of us as more of your outsourced CMO. So, you know, right. when you hire us, you get a pretty much CMO team with growth strategy thinking, um, which a lot of CMOs have been trained in traditional marketing. Um, you know, we have people who have done both traditional marketing and who are best in class in, in terms of growth hacking. So we get hired um, on a retainer basis. That's a way I'll, I'll take on clients because we need to have that working relationship and that partnership in order to help them grow. I mean, I'm looking at everything. Um, when I go into a company, for example, one that we're working with right now, I'm like, I want to see your customer service sale- logs. I want to see what are the customer service reps talking about? Let's talk about how they're trying to close people on the phone um, because all of that's marketing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, some companies are like, hey, you know, some agencies are like, hey, let's do like a fun campaign. But if the structure isn't implemented well, if everyone in your organization doesn't think of themselves as a marketer, you're wasting a ton of dollars. And that's the type of stuff. Not only are we doing the digital stuff, but my agency is also looking at what are the internal stuff? How do we need to clean up your messaging? How do we need to, you know, add like a little signature in your email that, that promotes what you're doing? I mean, these little things right. that results. It's interesting. It's almost goes back to tinkering or tweaking for companies and getting into the spaces that they're not really considering that could be a big benefit for them. Absolutely. And we call it a growth cycle. So, you know, going back to tech, uh, you know, kind of the same thing where, where devs do agile sprints, we do growth cycles. So we're looking in cycles. Okay, here are the three things we're going to test. We're going to hack this copy. We're going to figure out uh, a really cool customer service campaign uh, that markets XYZ message. Um, let's really hit it hard uh, and do an email campaign for this niche market. Um, And then let's implement some technical hack. Let's do engineering as marketing. Maybe there's some scripts we need to implement on your website to automate some things. Uh, We are coming on and with a commitment to help organizations grow. Um, And it's an overtime, long-term relationship that we have with, with each of the companies we work with. I love that. So now how important are partnerships to you as a small business, uh, at your own small business, working with partners or different people in different spaces or who have different kinds of expertise? It's so huge. I'm really an advocate of, you know, find a great group of people to get rich together and to do amazing together, to serve other people together. Uh, So we have a ton of different traction channel partners, as we, we call them. So, you know, we have our core team internally, and then we have traction channel partners in PR and SEO. Um, and these are the people who are the best in class on what they do. And we bring them on um, and I develop, I work with, you know, the founder or, you know, the head of that company to co-develop a package that we can collectively sell out into the marketplace. So it's coming from a place of abundance um, mm. and saying, you know, yeah, you're an agency too, but your secret sauce, I think about this one agency we work with in Santa Monica, their passion, they're an agency, but their passion's really in technology solutions. So I sat down with the founders and was like, okay, how can we leverage your technology to make what we do, the strategies that we build even better? Um, and how can we co-sell this? And, we're, you know, it's been such a great experience to work with other agencies and to see them as an asset, to see us as one bigger, greater agency with their strengths versus like, oh, no, I don't want to work with them because they've got other clients. Right. I want to steal my clients. I'm like, go ahead. If you want to steal a client, be my guest. Right. 
just know that I'm hustling way harder than you are and I'm going to get more clients. And right. that's just the way that this is going to work. <laughs> and like you said, too, coming from a space of abundance and then also thinking that it could be more powerful and pulling in the right people, of course, not just anybody, but. Absolutely. You yeah. can do more strength in numbers and it takes a village to build a business. It takes mm-hmm. a passionate tribe. And the things that I've talked about with my partners, um, these other founders, like we get really legit on, whoa, you know, this is hard or this isn't working or let's talk about this. And I'm learning from them too. Uh, right. There's many things about running an agency that I would never have been exposed to had I not had those great partners. And it, and it saves, it's a time saver too for people because sometimes we try to do everything, for example, and going back to social media, but if there's an agency that really specializes in something like their whole thing is about social media, that could be an example of someone that a company you want to partner with. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm like, let's do a co-branded package together. Let's sell it together. If I sell right. it, awesome. Let's co-implement it. Like, let's go, you know, whatever is going to make us, you know, win together. I am all about that, okay. which I wasn't early on in my entrepreneurial career. I was like, oh, I've got to be the one to do everything or it's just me. Uh, you know, it just doesn't work. It really doesn't work. And you'll burn yourself out. And that's mm-hmm. no fun. I think that's a myth that we're all sold for a long time too. this sort of I always talk about the self-made millionaire, the self-made right. this. And it's sort of like, but there even those people had teams behind them, whether they talk about them or not. Oprah has an advisor, someone right. that she speaks to. Tony Robbins has mentors, people that he looks to. But we always think, oh, that person did all of this by themselves. And it's 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 not the case. You know, no one does things by themselves. No one gets from point A to point B in a, a straightforward manner. There's bumps, there's hiccups, there's weird stuff that happens. You know, I think about even the president of the United States, think about all the people that are with him in this situation room or right. sitting in the sit room being, you know, he can like say, Hey, what are the facts? What's going on here? You need your own, you know, mastermind in the business world, but you need your own folks in the sit room. Who's mm-hmm. going to tell you who's going to be your eyes and ears on what's happening in social media? Um, you know, if you're running an agency, who's going to be your eyes and ears even on like how to hire talent because hiring talent is challenging. So right. who are you going to be able to rely on to help you with that? It's super critical if you want to be effective and not waste time. It's super critical to have the right people in the room. And even before, I think definitely once you get to the point of president or head of your company, but even thinking about who are those people that are there for you before you even get there, because the people with him in Chicago or when he was an organizer or, you know, so people sometimes we think, oh, when I get to that point, I'll get people to help me. But who are the people helping you along the way? Absolutely. And those are the most important people because they will grow, help you grow on your journey. Um, they will grow with you too. So it's a yes, at, you know, from day one, who are the strategic advisors? Who can I ha- ask about fitness, about health, about relationships? Mm. Fin- you know, I hired a financial coach because it was like, there's stuff I know I'm not doing. Um, you know, and who are these people that will be with me from dollar, you know, one all the way to, <laughs> to millions. Uh, yeah, to millions. <laughs> Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really important. Now, you're also working on a pilot program for small businesses. Um, tell us about that. Yes, exactly. So this is what I was alluding to. Um, and like full of transparency, we started off thinking, hey, let's build amazing courses because, you know, our agency, we work with bigger clients. Um, and, uh, you know, I love small businesses. I love entrepreneurship. And that's, you know, a real core part of how I'm wired. So I always want to give back to that community. Um, and you know, we had a lot of small businesses saying like, Hey, your prices are not really like small business prices, you know, but we would love to work with you. And I'm like, well, that's unfortunate because I'm here to serve and I want to help other people grow meaningful businesses. How can I uh, do something for small businesses in a sustainable cost effective way? Um, so we're working on, um, you know, and, and this is super high level, uh, but we're working on more of like an on-demand marketing, uh, you know, kind of process procedure and you know sidebar to what we're doing at salt is a bigger agency where we want to bring on a few small businesses as a part part of this pilot um, where they actually get on-demand expert uh, to a marketing uh, you know growth marketing strategist uh, someone that can help with things like digital ads or, or SEO or SEM and that can actually you know walk through some key things with them um, you know on a one-on-one basis at a, at a fixed rate so uh, again, this is super pilot. And as we talked about, the way I do things is like, boom, I'm going to put it out there. And if someone's interested, contact me and then, you know, we can get them into this pilot. So we're trying to see if, again, providing real time help mm-hmm. will be more powerful than having to send people through courses and seeing if that's going to work. That's interesting, because then, like you said, it's real time. People can get the help, the kind of help that they need in the right. moment. The courses and all that um, are great for a lot of companies, a lot of right. people. But sometimes like, but this right here is a thing I need right, right. now. 
right. Like my MailChimp is acting a fool. I need to like right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> And tell me what. And I don't want to Google it and look at some video from someone in some random place trying to tell me. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. So that's literally what this is for. I love uh, it. (laughs) So far, some of the the early businesses that we've talked to and that are, you know, signing up to be a part of this pilot, they're like, that is what I need. We'll probably still have courses on this platform, um, you know, and just educational modules. But how can we help people real time in a way that's going to help them, you know, say, right. done. My Facebook ads are moving. My MailChimp is moving. Um, you know, I have at least, you know, coming into this program, we want to give everyone a top line strategy for their business. You know, then it is a bit DIY, but you have someone to call if you get stuck. I love um, that. You know, so, so yes, we love anyone who's interested to like shoot me a note and then we can get you uh, signed up for that. So what is the, I'll have links of course for everything or emails, but what is the best way for people who are interested in um, something like going through the pilot program with yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. They can email me directly um, and it's Teju, T-E-J-U at Salt Group, S-U-L-T-E group.com. That's the best way. Okay, great. And it's fine if we give that email out. Oh, yeah, totally okay, fine. Good. I always That's ask it. everyone just a second time. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. I'm totally, you know, I, okay. I get tons of emails a day, like questions. I, I look through all of them and respond. And, you know, I'm here to help. I think that some of the most exciting parts of my entrepreneurial journey were people who are a couple steps ahead of me responded to my email. I was like, this may be a stupid question, but, um, you know, that 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 is so meaningful to me. And I want people to, you know, do the same to I me. Love, I love that. Great. I can't wait to give that email to people to get in touch with you. I think people are going to be interested. It sounds Absolutely. like a great program. Cool, 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 cool. So now you have a site called Teju.tv also that features videos of you doing all kinds of great hacks and giving great advice. What inspired you to create this? Was this something that you had before Salt Group or after or during? So after Soul Group, this is a recent endeavor. And, uh-huh. uh, you know, I was like, how can I? It was funny because I, I don't real, I didn't realize like one of my secret strengths is in hacking. Yes. The, the one right? on the jewelry organizing, people have to go see that. I, just, <laughs> I was like, that's brilliant. I just watched it. It was like, that is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always looking for ways to like optimize or like, how can I turn this into this? And, right. I don't think I realized that. Like, I, I have this, like, MacGyver spirit. So, um, you know, one day I was like, chatting with friends. I was like, dude, you need to share this stuff. Like, some of the stuff that you do is just, like, we don't even understand, but it's cool. <laughs> we wanna, you should probably share it. And um, I was like, great, I'm going to launch a beta site and, you know, uh, launch this YouTube show. I'd wanted to do it for a while. And it's a combination of, like, business. It's all with a hacking mindset. Like, how can you do less so that you have time to live more? How can you, you know, I work at a standing desk all day. Like, how can I, and, and that's one of my favorite hacks so that you don't feel pressured um, or you feel like you've been sedentary. You're getting a workout all day. So how can you, again, find little ways to tweak your life and optimize your, the food that you eat, the things that you do to net the biggest result. And that's what the show is all about. I love that. Now, one of the things you mentioned um, was that the you mentioned before our interview was that the proceeds of people subscribe, go to an organization or something that you're working with. Absolutely. So I'm a huge fan of microfinance. Um, I support tons of different microfinance organizations. I love Kiva and I really do believe that um, and I've always believed that microfinance is the way to change communities. So, um, you know, giving aid is one thing, but being able to teach someone to build a sustainable business helps them set up a legacy that goes and transcends beyond them. Uh, And I do believe that microfinance does this. So, um, you know, any proceeds that come from that channel, uh, percentage of those proceeds go to microfinance organizations. Um, and you know, I'm always, you know, working and teaching, uh, other people to be entrepreneurs because it's just such a powerful gift to know that no matter where you land, you can start something and take right. care of yourself and your family. And I think that that's what, what's so exciting about entrepreneurship. One of the taglines or the tagline, as you mentioned, uh, here for Teju.tv is, uh, do less, live more. Yes. So what is um, Teju doing less of today and what are you doing more of today? Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still working on this, to be super honest. I'm still working on this. But one of the things I am delegating a lot, uh, you know, I'm delegating a lot of stuff and we're, you know, working on, you know, I used to be doing the writing the email and editing the image and, you know, had Photoshop and InDesign and this and that and the other. And one of the things I, I have done quite recently was I hired a virtual assistant. Um, I hired uh, one that's US based and I hired an outsourced one. So now I have two. And they are there to help me with 
a ton of different things. I'm doing a less like task work and really trying to put my emphasis and focus more on the strategy that's going to grow the business. Um, you know, and this has given me a ton of time to do things like Teju TV to support some other organizations that I'm really passionate about, like Project Echo. Um, you know, to talk at uh, different schools for Youth Business Alliance. Um, and then also just like enjoy my family. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to make more time on the weekends to just shut down the laptop and know that things are getting done. Other people are handling things and I can actually enjoy my family. I love that. Where did you find your, did you use a certain resource to find your virtual assistants? Yeah, I use Upwork, um, okay. both of them. And it has been a legit game changer. It really has. And I wish I had done that race. I don't know why it, it took me so long. I wish I had done it like from day one. <laughs> well, you're a doer too. That's why sometimes, and it's hard for us to let go and think that other people can actually edit this photo better than I can, or even, or at least 80% as good as I can. Exactly. And I think it's okay. You know, the thing that changed it from one of my good friends said to me, we were having brunch and I was like, ah, oh, I'm like working a million hours. And he's like, you know, you've created this. And I was like, Ooh, slap in the face. Right. Okay. <laughs> Who asked you? Right. Yeah, actually I kind of have. And he's like, well, if you, Listen, if you hire people and they do 80%, 80%. of the job, your job then is just to manage the 20% and to train them to close that 20% gap. And that's what a leader is supposed to do. That's right. And that was super powerful for me. It shifted, you know, from me being like, oh, I've got to do everything to get it right, which was like such a wasted time. <laughs> right. So I have no clue what I'm doing in some of these Adobe programs and I would spend hours frustrated uh, on them. So, so yeah, it definitely shifted my thinking a ton. Great. Now, what has having a, a business, what's the greatest lesson that it's taught you about yourself as a woman? Oh, man, I think that, uh, and Marie Forleo says this, but anything's figure outable. Um, even when, like, you know, stuff is hitting the fan, Fui is just hitting the fan, uh, you know, just knowing that you'll be able to figure it out and be scrappy enough and make it through. And I think that, honestly, and I, again, I want to, like, advocate jumping from you know a paying job to being an entrepreneur without some sort of plan which is totally what I did uh but figuring it out that even when you go broke things are not as bad as you think they will be you still you know if you have your health if you have great relationships in your life at the end of the day that's the stuff that really really matters um and I think that being an entrepreneur I don't think I would have learned that lesson as quickly had I not gone through this experience. Mm -hmm. That's a thing too, looking at the experience, not so much as a failure or learning from the failures. It's just, what is the lesson here? What did I learn? And, and we all learn it in a different way. Like going through it the way you did is one way, going through it where people, I talk to other people like, I'm very much a pragmatist. So I did this step, this step, this step. Everybody learns it in a different way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I realize I'm, I'm super headstrong. I need to learn stuff like, when I'm, you know, I need to learn how to get water when I'm in the desert. Like, right. I, that's the only way I <laughs> that's learn. It. You know? It's like, oh, right. Okay, got it. I yeah. got it. I don't have to learn that again. Yeah, 100. I told you that four <laughs> years ago. And I'm like, yep, you definitely did. And I totally <laughs> didn't listen. So, <laughs> And here we are. <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> so what's next for you? What are you most excited about today? I am most excited about growing my business, uh, launching some new, we've got some other new initiatives. I'm always tinkering. I'll always be tinkering on new businesses. So there's some other stuff I'm tinkering on uh, right now that I'm excited about seeing how it fares. Um, and then I am working at the end of the summer, I'm working on a book um, that's related to this YouTube show that's all about doing less and living more. So I want to, you know, outside of the videos, share some of these hacks that I've learned um, in, in, one, in one place uh, for people to take a look at. And, you know, learn some new hacks that maybe they hadn't thought of. So that's what I'm most excited about. And then traveling. I'm, uh, I got accepted to a program called Remote Year. Mm. So, um, I'm going to spend the next year traveling. And I'm super. It's something I've always wanted to do. And um, it has pushed me to set my business up in such a scalable way uh, where I've had to really delegate and document, build an intranet so that, you know, when it comes time for, and this is not till next year, time to, you know, travel, I'm able to do that. And I have a rock star team that's going to keep the ship moving. I love that. What's the program called? It's called Remote Year. Remote, remote year. year. So you travel for the whole year. Travel for the whole, you're still working, but you right. go, from, you know, different co-working places and work, you know, you're with like 75 different entrepreneurs. And uh, I'm just so, it's something that's been on my bucket list. And I literally, the other day I said to my mom, I'm like, you know, I look back at my goals from five years ago, and it seemed like, you know, snail's pace to get here. But 
wow, I'm like getting this stuff done and traveling for a year was on my goals list. And this is, it's super exciting. I love that. And once you find that thing and the momentum picks up, if you're a person, you certainly are a person that goes with it, then you can really start seeing things start to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just surrender, let go, like let go. Right. That's the biggest thing. Just, you know, if something's working, just keep doing more of that and, you know, not get too stressed in the nitty gritty. I love that. So I just have a couple more questions for you. Thank you so much for your time today. You've been fantastic. No problem. No problem. Um, if you think over your life and your career and you had a chance to thank only one person whose Ooh. support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Oh, one person that I had to think, you know what, this is going to seem, I, I can't believe I'm even saying this, but I had a really difficult boss at one of my jobs. And I was like, this person is just a complete, you know, insert expletives here. And <laughs> I just didn't understand like why this person is, uh, it was just being so difficult. You know, why are they really challenging me? Why are they really pushing me? Um, you know, I had incidents where I cried. I was like, this is, you know, they're really making me feel like I, uh, you know, wasn't in the right place. And I think that that was the best thing for me. And I thank that person for helping me feel so uncomfortable that I needed to quickly do the hard work internally and figure out what I needed to do to make myself comfortable. And it helped me also develop a thick skin um, to stand up for myself, stand up for my worth, not take any you know what. Um, and I needed that to, to be a, a fearless entrepreneur. I don't think I would have gotten that without it. You never know where the lessons are going to come from. Yeah, exactly. At that time, it was so hard. But, um, you know, you know I, think, I think the people who said I couldn't, I think the people that really challenged me because it was such a beautiful lesson in your own resilience and strength. Nice. So final question, how can we support you? We're going to go to the links and all the great things that you mentioned. Yep. But what else is, is there anything else we can do to support you? So uh, the best thing would be, uh, you know, to go over to saltgroup.com um, and check out our social media. We have a really beautiful Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, we'd love for people to follow us. Um, then head over to Teju TV and subscribe to my channel. You can subscribe right from uh, my website and check out those videos and share with your friends. If you find a video that is a really good tip for you or something that inspires you, we'd really appreciate your support and having you share it with I love that. And lastly, what's a parting piece of advice from you? Not that you haven't given us tons of great advice in oh. this, <laughs> this interview already, which I so appreciate you, but what's a, a parting piece of advice? I think the biggest thing is go for it. Um, you know, go for it, go for it, go for it. You only get to run this race once and you want to look back at the end and say, wow, I really pushed it. My, my lungs are burning. I'm sweating. <laughs> I'm like ugly mascara and everything, but I really pushed it. And I think that that is such a fulfilling experience. Live every day like it's your last. And, you know, not to think of that in a negative light, in a positive light. Like you, then you get to really playful out and live a rich life. Um, and, uh, you know, that would definitely be my parting advice. Teju, thank you so much. You've been fantastic. I appreciate it. Hold on just one second. All right. Thank you so much for listening to that episode of the Support is Sexy podcast. And I do hope that you got some inspiration from it. And the challenge is for you to do at least one thing. Take one thing from the episode, at least one thing. You can always do more, but at least one thing that will help you move one step closer to your dream. Whether that's launching a business, writing a book, whatever that thing is that you want to do, take something from this episode and move one step closer. And what I'll also ask of you, if you can tell me what you think about the episodes, what we've been doing, what you want to hear what you like, what you experience while you're listening, go over to iTunes, leave us a review and let me know what's going on. What are you thinking? What are you feeling about the show? What else can I do to be of service to you, which is what this is all about, to be of support to you. That's our buzzword, right? You can also go to my website, elainefluker.com slash podcast. So that's E-L-A-Y-N-E. F-L-U-K-E-R dot com slash podcast. Hear more episodes there. Also have a bunch of great videos, tons of information. It's where I'm going to be spending a lot of time and it's where I'd love to connect with you. So again, thank you so much for listening. I truly appreciate you and your support. And the most important thing I want you to remember is having it all does not mean doing it all alone. So now go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.